Hey, it's me again. Decided to do another one of these videos where I just rant into the camera, give you my thoughts on training, philosophy on how I've done what I've done. Today's topic is going to be fear and doubt, and how these two things are most likely holding you back without you even realizing it. When people think about fear and doubt in training, they think about kind of the cliche 1980s kind of no pain, no gain nonsense. The idea that, you know, you can't let pain hold you back, the idea you can't let intensity hold you back, the idea you can't worry about breaking a sweat or throwing up in the gym like Arnold talked about in Pumping Iron. There is some value in this, yes. You, you shouldn't have pain aversion be your guiding principle in your training. You should be willing to move out of your comfort zone. These are important things. But what a lot of people don't think about when they think about fear and doubt holding the back is the, the subtle ways it creeps into it and even the sometimes logical ways that these two things can interfere with how you train. One of the greatest examples, and a very controversial one that people tend to disagree with me on, but one I hold true, is what I call planning for failure. What this, a good example of this would be, I give someone a workout to do, and say one of the workouts, uh, one of the movements in it is squats. They immediately will ask, well, what do I do when I fail a squat? How do I fail a squat? And what this says to me is it's someone who fears squatting and they're letting it interfere with their training. It's a negative mentality. It's planning to fail. Your first thought should not be, how do I fail on this program? It should be, how do I succeed on it? How do I get better via this program? The last thing you should be worried about is what happens when things go wrong. Your entire mentality should be focused on what happens when things go right. How do I make this go right? How do I extend gains for as long as possible? There, there could be some value in knowing how to fail, but honestly, your body is a lot smarter than your brain in that aspect. It'll figure out what to do relatively quickly when push comes to shove. Usually, it'll dump the bar forward or backwards or something will happen that'll prevent you from doing another squat. Your body will take care of itself. But the time and energy you're investing on planning to fail is energy that you could invest on planning to succeed. And in your brain, you're going to have these doubts in the back of your head that are reinforcing failure. I now have a game plan for when I fail. I'll know what to do when I fail. Borrowing from historical examples, if you've ever read The Art of War, there's a section that talks about how when fighting an enemy, you should never corner them and remove all elements of escape from them, any escape path from them. The reason being is because when a man has no escape path, he's got nothing less to lose, and he'll fight with everything that he's got. But when given an avenue of surrender, they'll reserve themselves. They'll, they'll fight hard, but when given a chance to give up, they'll give up. Well, you need to put yourself in the position of that person with no escape path. You need to have no plan for failure so that failure is not an option. It's one of those cliche buzzwords we throw around, but people don't realize just the value in saying failure is not an option. It doesn't mean we can't fail. It means you can't even have the concept of failure be a possibility. Success has to be your only avenue. If you have this mentality, it's going to allow you to continue progressing at any opportunity because you simply cannot fail. And you will know every time you go into the gym, I'm not going to fail because I cannot fail because I have to succeed because that's the only option. You'll find yourselves planning how to succeed in your next lifting event. Anytime you have downtime, your thoughts will gravitate towards how will I succeed. But if you start out every time you train with how am I going to fail, that's going to be the priority of your training. Other examples are when given a program and not even a question of the exercises, people wonder, well, what was my next program after this one? Again, there is value in plotting out programs, yes, but you, you shouldn't plan on this program failing. You kind of need to attack it with that mentality, you know, somewhat stupidly so, that this program will not fail. It's, it, it's benefited me quite a bit. I followed beginner programs for the majority of my training, having only recently switched to 531, which I consider a little bit more advanced based on the fact that it's not a daily linear progression, but more of a weekly percentage-based program. Prior to that, I simply followed progressive overload. I said, all right, every time I train, I'm going to do more reps or I'm going to do a higher weight, but I'm not going to do the same thing I did the last time. Most people, educated people, believe that they can only do this for so much time and then it would eventually stall and they'd have to pick a new program, but I simply refuse to accept that. I refuse to believe it. As a result, I was able to get relatively decent lifts. I mentioned them in my previous video. It's, it's done well for me. Um, another example you can have in training is people that can't bench without a spotter. Again, this is planning to fail. I've never had a spotter in my training career, barring maybe one or two exceptions at a commercial gym when someone rushes to save me, quote unquote, because the rep is slowing down. But otherwise, I do the majority of my training by myself. I do the majority of my benching by myself. I bench in my power rack at home. I do have safety pins there in case something goes wrong, but 
When you have no option of failure, when you have no one that can save you, you'd be amazed at how many more reps you're able to get versus when you have that safety net. A lot of people simply come to rely on it. They, they push themselves just a little bit, exert themselves, and then just give up and give it to the spotter. Once again, it's that whole no avenue of failure, no avenue of, of surrender. If you're in that situation, you'll find that you push yourself, you exert yourself. Other way fear and doubt comes into play is this concept of really over-education. I believe everyone should read. I believe everyone should study lifting. I believe there's a great historical and cultural benefit to it. But at the same time, if you believe everything you read, you're just going to mentally sabotage yourself. People buy into things like um, squatting 5x5 five five is too much volume. Squatting three times a week is too much volume. Deadlifting 5x5 five five is too much volume. Deadlifting every week is too much volume. People hear this and they believe it and they follow it. And really, it's just their mind sabotaging them. When I first started training, it was common to just do straight sets of five sets of five reps. Same weight the whole time. You did that three times a week. You did it with squats. You did it with deadlifts. You did it with whatever. And you just ate. And you did fine. The Barbarian Brothers in the 80s had the saying that there's no such thing as overtraining, simply under eating. Granted, those guys were using a great deal of other supplements. But it still holds true though. You could be amazed what you can do if you actually just push yourself in the gym and then outside the gym with your eating and rest protocols. You run into similar situations just um, with, with just the other concepts that people wrap their brains around that they believe that they can't do. They can't lift weights and perform conditioning or else their lifts are going to suffer. Why? Well, because they heard it from somewhere. Another great common one is the idea that the overhead press has to stall first. Why? Because you read somewhere that it has to stall first? Who, who says? You know, it's another one of those lifts where I did, not, I did not read anything about it, and I did not believe the things I read. I was having great success with it, and I just kept pushing myself. And I've never run into a lot of the stalling issues people say. Granted, it is a slow-moving lift for me, yes, but it stalls just as frequently as everything else. It's, it's kind of a borderline approach. But the reality is, is you should be smart but you have to be stupid at the same time. You have to be smart enough to read and develop new ideas, but dumb enough not to believe them all, dumb enough not to accept them all. The people that wrap themselves around the axle over the newest and greatest training protocol are the ones that just burn out and never make any progress. They just spin their wheels forever because they've got a great new idea that they have to invest in. Whereas people that pick a program and just stick with it stupidly and boldly follow forward with it, they tend to do rather well. A lot of people see this with guys at the gym that don't know anything. You see the, the elitism on message forums. It's, oh, this guy doesn't know about compound lifts. This guy didn't read starting strength. He doesn't. But the reality is, is usually this guy is bigger and stronger than you. He's not on a great program, but he's dedicated. He sticks with it, and he believes in what he's doing, and he pushes himself in the gym. And that dedication and, and intensity and exertion, it carries a lot of weight when it comes to progress. You can be on the greatest program out there, but if you're not pushing yourself you're not going to get anything from it. And once again, this is kind of where that fear and doubt comes in. A lot of people will go on forums and they'll ask, what's the best program to follow? And most forums are just kind of a zone where one person is the authority and everyone else parrots him. And you'll get told starting strength is the best program or strong lifts is the best program or small off is the best program or what have you. And people just believe it, but they don't really. They just kind of buy the party line and then they go to the gym and they have doubts about the program and as a result they don't invest themselves in it and they make zero gains and they come back and think it's the program's fault. When really getting bigger and stronger, it's simple. People have been doing it for years. You lift heavy shit and then you eat a lot and you sleep a lot and the next time you go to the gym you lift heavier shit. I just wrote a book right there. It's amazing how little it takes but people want to believe that there's some secret, there's some trick to it that when they get this simple plan, they don't believe it, they don't buy it, and then it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The fear and doubt gets in their head, they think that what they're invested in isn't going to lead them to success, and it doesn't lead them to success, and then they get to validate themselves. A lot of times people will blame it on genetics or what have you, and really, if you're just starting out, unless your genetics made you paraplegic, it's not going to be that much of a factor. If you have the same basic advantages as everyone else, having multiple functioning limbs, and don't have some sort of inebriating palsy, you're going to be fine. Just stick with it, lift heavier weights, eat a lot of food, sleep a lot, you'll get bigger and stronger. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's simple. And people let just the simple things get to them. And people overanalyze the smallest things. Uh, Jim Wendler talks about majoring the minors. And it's one of the, the biggest ways that fear and doubt play in people's heads. 
One of the classic examples is people that follow 20 rep squats. Great program. I think everyone, regardless of goals, should do one four to six week program of 20 rep squats. You can get the book on Ironmind or Amazon, Super Squats, amazing read, all of 90 pages. You can do it in an afternoon, 12 bucks, dirt cheap. Everyone owes it to themselves to read this book and do this program to learn some mental intensity, toughness, and fortitude. That said, it has this basic concept of rest pause in it, where you take three deep breaths minimum in between reps and it allows you to recover and squat up and down and, and the program works. Well, people will do the program and then inevitably they get back to a basic strength program and they notice that they're taking breaths in between their, their reps. And they start freaking out, wondering if, oh man, am I rest pausing? Do these reps count? Do they, am I not getting strong? When really, if you're still adding weight, regardless of breaths in between, it's the same program you're following, it's the same protocol. Things would change if one day you took no breaths and the next day you took breaths in between and then the third day you took a breath only between reps three and four and what have you. But if you're following the same premise the entire time and adding weight under the same conditions, you're getting stronger. The reality is that a lot of people don't know how to verify results. They don't know what an evaluatable metric is. They base it off of things like soreness or how tired they are when they're done or, or God, I have no idea, honestly. I really couldn't wrap my brain around some of the voodoo that people utilize in order to measure how successful a program is, when really it's simple. Keep a logbook, and if you're lifting more weight today than you did yesterday or the day before, you're getting stronger. If you step on the scale and you weigh more, you're getting bigger. Yes, fat will creep in along with muscle, but if you're eating more and lifting heavier weights, you are gaining muscle. You can overeat, it does happen, but really, who am I to say that that's a bad thing? Those, anyone who's been following my program or training protocols knows that I went up to about 217 pounds at age 21. I got fat, but I was able to cut down the majority of it, retain most of my muscle, retain my lifts. It was honestly a positive thing. I could not in good conscience recommend the way that I ate and trained during that day. It's most likely unhealthy, but it worked for me. I'd go to Taco Bell and eat four to six cheesy gordita crunches. I'd have six double stacks at Wendy's. I'd drink a gallon of milk a day. I'd eat two slices of bread and a carton of cottage cheese before bed. I put on one to two pounds every week and I felt miserable, but boy, did I get strong. But people will see a little bit of fat creeping in and they'll wonder if maybe they're not gaining any muscle at all and they'll freak out and then they'll radically cut and they'll reduce their calories and then their strength will go to shit. And then they'll think their program is bad and then they'll switch programs and, and again, it's a little fear and doubt creeps in your head. You know, it's basically, you have to believe in yourself. It's corny, it's a cliche, but it's a reality. And even if you don't honestly believe it, fake it. Tell yourself every day that what you're doing is gonna work. Read the things that are gonna reinforce it. Read positive things. I talked about 20 rep squats. The whole Iron Mind community is based around positive mental growth. These books help. A lot of people get on forums and forums are just toxic if you don't know what's going on. I, I'm guilty of posting on them, yes, but my goal is to assist people. But the reality is, is they're a festering ground for stupidity. People, anyone can say anything on a forum. There don't, no one has to have any sort of degree or license or accountability. And you have no idea who has the best advice unless you actually hang out on one and see who produces consistent results versus some guy who just read starting strength and thinks that they're God's gift to lifting. I would suggest reading established authors with good backgrounds. Uh, personal favorites, Pavel Satsuline, uh, Dave Tate, Louis Simmons, Jim Wendler, Matt Kroxlowski. I'm butchering most of these names, I'm sure. Uh, the uh, Super Squats I had already mentioned, Stuart McRobert, these are all great authors, they all have great points, and more importantly, a lot of their work is geared towards telling the lifter that they are doing great things and they will become a great lifter. Having this reinforced in your head as you're training is a boon. Everyone owes it to themselves to think that they will one day be big and strong following these programs. And when that happens, it doesn't matter what kind of rough patch you go through in the journey, you know what the end result is going to be. If I just hit the brakes as soon as a little fat gain hit, I would not be as strong as I am today. Simple fact. I might have been more ascetic during that time when I was going through that weight gain period, but really, screw it. I was a young 20-year-old kid. I mean, I, I had the genetics to be able to hold back. My blood work turned out fine as a result because I could handle this situation. It's not something I would do in my 30s or 40s when that occurs, but that's why I saved it for my early 20s. Take the time, believe in yourself, follow your program with intensity, if you don't believe in the program, find one you believe in. I honestly would not care if it is a suboptimal program as long as it's one that will get you in the gym and push yourself. Don't plan to fail and simply get in there and bust your ass. If you do that, you'll have success.